On the Sunday following his inauguration, the very next day, the president took his problem to the great councilor. He went to church and bowed his head in prayer as he'd done on the morning of March 4th before proceeding to the Capitol to take the oath. And while we cannot know what Franklin D. Roosevelt confided to his God or asked of his God, we do know that the people felt an even greater reassurance in this simple act of devotion on the part of the man who had so thrilled and uplifted them. And then, without the loss of an hour, he called in his secretary of the treasury, William H. Wooded, and planned and executed those brilliant and decisive strokes by which the country's financial structure was preserved. By declaring a bank holiday, he halted the growing panic and provided a breathing spell in which to readjust credit and provide more currency. The 9th was a notable day in our history, with Congress eagerly accepting the President's recommendation. By a vote of 73 to 7, the United States Senate hastened to pass the President's banking measure. It was the most emphatic vote of confidence which that body had given to the head of the nation in many a long year. In the House, the new Speaker, white-haired Henry W. Rainey of Illinois, was at the throttle and running the legislative locomotive in the direction of his party leader, the President, was demanding it should go. Rainey knew it was no time for quibbling. Straight through, he drove the Roosevelt measure. Intense interest was shown in the House as the clerk read the President's great economy bill, which planned the saving of 500 million. And with the banking situation smoothing out, the President went on the air on the night of Sunday, March the 12th, and talked to the people in simple, friendly terms. The bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. No sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors. It is possible, of course, in a very few places that when the banks resume, a very few people who have not recovered from their fear may again begin withdrawals. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system that is more important than currency, more important than gold. And that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. An entirely new spirit came over the face of the government under the president's guidance. For the first time in history, the Treasury Department, under orders from Secretary Wooden, permitted pictures to be made of the processes of printing and engraving United States currency in the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington. Why, it made the old timers gasp they were so startled. Confident in their president, in his policies, people all over the country rushed back to replace the deposits as the closed banks reopened their doors. All over the land, business and trading felt the impetus of this new confidence and courage. The wheels began to turn again. There was a rush of trading in the great Chicago wheat pit. In the New York stock market, prices rose sharply. People began to buy it, and encouraging reports were heard on all sides about the upturn in business that had come at last. A memorable day, when at the president's behest, the Senate, in record time, voted for beer, and the end of the long drought was in sight.
Elated but resolute, the president sat at his desk, facing one new problem after another. With the financial structure of the country strengthened and revitalized, with new impetus given to commerce and industry, his mind now turned to farmers and their play, to the truck farmers who raise our vegetables, and to the big grain farmers who provide our bread. And his thoughts took in also the distressing situation of the sheep raisers of the West. And as to what could be done soundly and practically for those men whose flocks cover a thousand hills, a wealth of wool and of mutton, and no market worth the trouble of shipping. And as our president sat and thought at his desk, he visioned the troubles of the western cattlemen sons and descendants of the bold spirits who carved out the famous cattle trails of the Old West. And in his mind's eye, no doubt, he could see the great and useless herds of fine beef for which also there was no price to bring joy to the heart of the cowman. The days passed swiftly in that historic month of March 1933 when so much was done and so much was planned. And this man of many burdens gave his whole mind and soul to pondering the swift and practical things. And to him came the great vision of relieving unemployment by a great reforestation project embracing 10 states to provide work for 250,000 men and to create new farms, new towns, new wealth for the people as a whole clearing and reinvigorating the forests of the land. Providing the building material which industry needed. Visioning the progress of timber from the new forests that are to arise to the mills of industry that will await them in the future. Forests that will not be robbed by haste and by greed. His rapid mind moved on to the 22nd of that historic march to another decisive stroke. At his desk in the White House, he signed the bill which kept one of the most important pledges of the Democratic platform, the pledge to give beer back to the people if the democracy came into power. There it was, the document which reversed the ironclad restrictions of 13 years. And immediately all over the country, the work of preparing to brew good beer was begun. The cobwebs of years of neglect were swept from back. Armies of men were called to polish the brewing machinery, to put the long neglected plants in perfect order for the rush of business that was certain to come. Another emphasis was given to business when the president put his name to the beer bill and made it law. brushed the barrels and they brushed up the brewery horses. And even the horses felt the gay stimulus of the New Deal. And Broadway got lit up to celebrate. beer has had anything to do with it. Something fine has occurred in this great country. You can actually see people going to work. Factories which have been closed for months, for years in some cases, have called for men, have started the wheels to turning, and are resuming the long interrupted routine of production. America is catching its full stride. There is a new feeling of hope, of determination in the air. It is a new march of prosperity behind the country's militant leader. The Fighting President.
Important world history is being made these days in London and elsewhere. New leaders, new ideas have seized the minds of men. Events are moving swiftly in the direction of progress, economic stability, and peace. Outstanding in the great forward steps toward world unity are the Geneva Disarmament Conference and the World Monetary and Economic Conference here in the British capital. In the new Geological Museum at South Kensington, uh, in these rooms which workmen are now fitting out for their significant role, the fate of civilization itself may well rest. And in these far-sighted strivings for universal good, two great leaders stand out. Two great leaders of two great English-speaking nations. Two men of widely separated antecedents, but of singularly similar viewpoints and leadership. Prime Minister J. Ramsey MacDonald of Great Britain and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the United States. Premier MacDonald was born in 1866 in the little Scotch town of Lossiemouth in Elgin County, far to the north on Moray Firth. He was of humble origin and is practically self-educated. At 19, he came to London to do secretarial work and a few years later found him active in the socialist movement serving his apprenticeship at Soapbox Oratory in Hyde Park and Trafalgar Square, and becoming noted in labor circles as an organizer and writer. Little did the nation suspect in those Victorian days that the lean, long-haired Scotch scribbler would one day be a world figure, secretary of the Labor Party for 11 years, and then its leader, member of the London County Council for four years, and then elected as a member of parliament. These were the steps by which he rose to high estate in the nation's affairs. The Labor Party's great success in 1923 resulted in his selection as Prime Minister. And as their majesties wrote to Parliament in the auspicious year of 1924, with all the famous trappings of age-old regal pomp and ceremony, the entire world marveled at the curious twist of British democracy that plucked from the masses from the very bosom of anti-patriotic internationalism, a self-made battler against British conservatism, to be the king's man, the creator of a ministry, the maker of government. <laughs> Premier Macdonald's Scots sagacity soon became paramount in all international debt parlors. In Paris, he is welcomed by Premier Ario on the eve of the Lausanne Conference. His stand on settlements and cancellation at Lausanne ring on the world. And again in Paris, he and Premier Ariot confer at the critical moment when the French leader is facing the wreck of his ministry over the December war debt payment. And then came the Prime Minister's epical trip to Rome. General Balbo, Italian air minister, himself pilots the huge trimotored hydroplane with the McDonald party aboard from Genoa to Ostia. And there, for the first time on record, Premier McDonald and Premier Mussolini meet on Italian soil. A meeting destined to result in the announcement of the famous Four Power Treaty, Europe's own peace pact, embracing Britain, France, Germany, and Italy. It is during this important conference in Il Duce's own office that the elements of Mussolini's recently adopted peace plan is dropped, a ten-year pact that now, months after its presentation, looms as one of the outstanding instruments of the era in world politics. As the originator of the McDonald disarmament plan, the British Premier was the first European leader sought out by President Roosevelt after the great change in administration at Washington. Invited to confer with the American President prior to the Geneva and London parlors, the Premier and his gracious daughter journeyed to the United States, where they received with honor and acclaim by the city of New York in the fleeting minutes they have to spend in New York waters. The eyes of America and of the world are on McDonald today as he lands, boards a train for Washington. The peace and probable prosperity of all nations are in the balance. This visit means much to the summer's parlance. 
And on those parleys rests the structure of modern civilization itself. An agreeable, almost a startling surprise awaits Premier McDonald at the White House, the American presidential residence. Instead of expected stiffness and formality, the president and his charming wife are out on the front steps to greet with warmth and true American hospitality their guests from overseas. The prime minister long has been close to the hearts of the American public. His tribute to the forever nameless American fighting man whose heroic dust lies under the slab at their unknown soldier's tomb won their high regard. The self-educated Scotchman of the 80s is made a doctor of laws by George Washington University and gets a real thrill out of the collegiate mortarboard. On his visit to the majestic capital, home of the American Congress and the seat of government, he is accorded the courtesy of the United States Senate and addresses the lawmakers of our sister nation, winning great applause and praise by his apt and enlightening remarks. One of the highlights of his stay in Washington is his appearance at the National Press Club, the shrine of American newspaper dump. And hosts of the National Press Club. I am really delighted to be your guest once again. We want the machinery of production and of consumption to begin to go round again. And we can't do that by any system of pure nationalist economics. My American friends, if you want to come across a good nationalist, go to Scotland in order to find them. I'm proud of being a nationalist. I'm proud of my history. I'm proud of my culture. I'm proud of my kith and my kin. I'm proud of the part that we have played in the history of mankind. But if I translate that pride of mine, that nationality of mine, into nationalist economics, if I engage in the rather tragic delusion of imagining that a Scotland made economically self-contained is going to make its tribute to the world's wealth, then what I shall find is this, that I shall both impoverish myself and impoverish my neighbors outside my own boundaries. The United States, Great Britain, France, must protect themselves. We have been going through difficult times. What's the way to handle them? Agree how to get out of them. Happiness, contentment, enjoyed by large populations, living on high standards of life, can only be maintained by a freely flowing international exchange. And how we are going to devise that freely fro flowing exchange is to be the main purpose of the International Economic Conference. Other well-known diplomats arrive in Washington for preliminary talks with Roosevelt and with Cordell Hull, American Secretary of State, including Prime Minister Bennett of Canada and Edouard Ariel, former Premier of France. His mission ended, Premier MacDonald says goodbye to Washington, having laid the groundwork for Anglo-American cooperation in the momentous days to follow. Days that are to startle the world with Roosevelt's appeal to all nations for immediate action on the MacDonald disarmament plan and for real constructive results at the London Economic Conference.
And so the premiere is welcomed back to number 10 Downing Street by a nation enthusiastically impressed with the greatness of his efforts for world betterment. What manner of man is Roosevelt, the sudden idol and magic leader of the American people, whose first bold strides into...